name is Denise Van Buren, and I'm the president of the Beacon Historical Society. Uh, Chris, can you go tell Brittany to turn off the music? Unless we all just want to sing. <laughs> that would be fun too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is good. While the music is still playing, I'll um, make a couple of public safety announcements. A lot of wires here, right? So be very careful if you come up here. Be particularly careful here because if you trip on that one, you're going to pull the laptop and the projector off. And then I'm out of business for perpetuity. So be careful, particularly around the projector. Uh, there is an exit here if you need it. There are restrooms out in front of the bar. Uh, our programs have been running about 45 minutes and maybe even an hour with questions. I want you to know that if you want to get up and go get another beer, you're welcome to do so. The bar closes tonight at 9 o'clock. We will be out probably around 8 or so. But um, feel free if you want to get up and you have to use the restroom or you want to get another beer to do so. Does it look like, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Whew, okay. <laughs> All right, are we ready to begin? Yes. Does it look like we have anybody else? All right, fabulous. Let me turn this on and make sure we're good to go with this. All right, I always like to start by knowing um, how many of you were born in Deacon? Keep your hands up. Okay, how many of you, your parents were born in Deacon? Keep your hand up. Wow, okay, how many of you, your grandparents were born in Deacon? Wow, okay, isn't that amazing? All right, uh, Judy, you're show up. Great grandparents. No, she draws a line. Liz, all right. <laughs> so, uh, why do I ask that? Because we're going to be talking about a lot of our historic businesses and, and uh, manufacturers tonight during our slideshow. So if you have a, you know, a family member who worked there and you wanted to add something, do feel free to. Um, this is the Hopped Up on History program, and we're so grateful to Two Way Brewing for inviting us to present this series, which is a total of there's six um, programs all together just meant to be fun and informal look at Beacon's history. Um, but I like in the Hopped Up on History series to hop around a lot, okay? So you're gonna say afterward, oh, why didn't she do it chronologically or why didn't she do it by industry? Well, that just would have made too much sense. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I was putting it together in my mind's eye, they kind of flowed together and I'm hoping that you will agree tonight. The other thing is we've had so many manufacturers and so many companies here in Beacon that um, I, I don't have anybody in here that's going to be like a maker of really combust um, consumables. Things like the Alp Sweet Shop, which we all know has been on Main Street for 100 years, or um, things like the great soap manufacturer who's on Main Street, right? Um, what I'm really talking about here are products that were made or built in Beacon. So we're not going to talk about marshmallows or any type of grocery product, um, <laughs> focusing on really what the factories were making in Beacon. And what I hope you'll walk away with is a new appreciation for the fact that most people who are moving in today or visiting today think of this as a tourist town, right? Come on a Saturday and try to find a parking spot on a Saturday, you'll think it's a tourist town. Well, the truth is that we have a, a really proud manufacturing tradition, and that's why I'm so glad to see this great crowd who's come out tonight to learn about products that were made, that were built in Beacon. I start every presentation the same way by recognizing our longtime city historian who we lost a couple of years ago to cancer. Um, he was our president for 20 years. He wrote our newsletter for 38 astounding years every single month. I co-authored a couple of books with him. He was, in short, an encyclopedia of Beacon history. So a lot of what I draw on in my notes um, you know, all actually comes from the work that, that Bob had done. So if you're not yet a member of the Beacon Historical Society, I do have um, some information about joining the Historical Society here on the table, and I'd be happy to answer your questions afterward. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a couple commercial messages. Those of you who have attended a couple different times know that um, you can't escape me without having some commercials. There he is. Hi, hey. Noah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Okay. <laughs> you need a beer, my friend. So I already gave the commercial message. Go out and get a beer if anybody wants one anytime. Okay, so with that, I really do want to start um, telling you a little bit about our first business woman who really settled our community. And that, of course, is her home. We don't have an image of what she looked like. But that is Katharina Rombaut Brett. Now, um, Madam Brad is important when we talk about things made in Beacon because she is going to come here, the first European settler, if you will, about 1708 with her husband. And they are going to together build a mill. They're later going to build a storehouse on the waterfront. Hi, welcome. Oh, we know you, Brittany. Brittany is our host. Can you give her a round of applause? She's the host of if you'd like. They're over behind the, 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 is that a pool table or a foos table? Uh, and so they're going to have a mill that is so successful and really so early that even settlers from as far away as Goshen, 
are going to cross inland uh, from Goshen to get to the Newburgh waterfront, row across the Hudson River. They're going to grind their grain at Madame Brett's mill, and then they're going to turn around and do the reverse trip. We have firsthand accounts of people doing that. So very early on, we are a milling center. And here we're going to produce grain, so important. Um, she builds the first uh, mouth, of the first mill rather, near the mouth of the creek, probably as soon as they come here, 1708, 1709. Astoundingly, 200 years later, we still had listed in the Beacon City Directory, 1913, Thomas Devereaux, occupation miller. He is operating still into the 1900s. Can you imagine oh, 200 years after Madame Brett had come? Still a mill. Now, you're all too uh, young to remember this, but it was a working grist mill. It was located on Churchill Street, just down the bend from Main Street. Uh, it was called the Matawan Flouring Mills by 1913, but it had already been grinding grain since about 1800. That was the date that was carved in its cornerstone uh, at the same time that Adam Skank, uh, Abram Skank brother took over the mill. The old Skank mill was a landmark on the Fishkill Creek uh, for parts of three centuries. The 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, think about that. Farmers and feed dealers were still doing business there right up until the last, the next, the, the last century. But in February of 1915, fire consumed the last of our old mills. The skank mill was a total loss. Only the massive oak frame was left standing right on Churchill Street. The <coughs> mill's machinery was sold to a Newburgh junk dealer for $7. <laughs> but if you will, this area of the creek, from there up to what we are all going to probably recognize as the roundhouse complex, is really the crucible of our manufacturing center here in what was then the village of Mattywan. This site, as you know, became a junkyard, and now I think it's new housing, right? The Fishkill Creek, of course, was this engine that is going to bring so many businesses to then the village of Mattywan. It powered turbines that were needed for the machinery of the Industrial Revolution, but also, in truth, and it's hard for us to accept or understand today, this was also a way for them to dispose of their wastes. For those of you who grew up in Beacon, you remember the hat shops, you remember when they dyed different colors, the water turned different colors, right? So it's going to power their turbines, but it's also going to be a way for them to easily discharge their wastes. Here's a kind of idealized, well, a rather idealized view of 1820 of the Madiwan Company. That, can you see that large building there in the, in the center? It's the first cotton mill that we have here. It's erected by Peter A. Skank. Skank is a name that we should all recognize if we're here in Beacon. And his partner, a man named Philip Hone, who was fabulously wealthy and who was a one-time mayor of New York City. Uh, today, that site is what we know as One East Main Street. It's later going to split into different concerns on either side of East Main Street, including Roundhouse. But this is the, the germ, if you will. This is where it all begins. When they spread across the street to um, the Roundhouse side, they're going to refer to that property as the annex, to this main property. See where the creek is running. That's how you know that that's this factory on that side of the creek. Here uh, is a later view of the same building that you see here with its tower on the top of it. Um, it's a cotton mill, and it's there on East Main Street. Uh, know that Madiwan was what we think of as a company town. And so what does a company town have? It has a company store. They had built houses on what we know today as North and South Street there, right off of Main Street. And this was the company store. You see David Davis Goods. The cornerstone for that building is down here, 1818. Um, they built the store. They built housing for the workers. The store, however, was raised in 1877 in order to widen the road near the Mattiwan Depot. And most of us probably know what that Mattiwan Depot was, right? We know um, the building that's there uh, in the East End. This critical location for our, our growth is going to change repeatedly throughout the decades. Uh, again, powered by its location on the Fishkill Creek, now not only discharging waste in the creek, but also access to what? Trains, train. train lines that are running there. Um, though they will split apart years later, the site we know today as the Roundhouse begins as an annex to that original One East Main Street. The Matawan Manufacturing Company, seen here, had many other uses, including Branley Dye Works. So it seems to me not so long ago that they took down these buildings, right? When the, when the McAlpines bought the, uh, the complex, many of them were unstable and they removed them. But I know that a lot of you will recognize that as the way it looked. Here too, you know, just to give you an idea, the size of the complex and how large it is, 
This is your landmark, because what is this? The Roundhouse, right? And you recognize that. Presbyterian Church. Presbyterian Church, which, which is going to burn, designed by Richard Morris Hunt, and St. Joachim's steeple, okay? Just to give you an idea as to how thriving this complex was. Um, this is also going to be one of the areas that is very, very much involved in our hat making industry, which I'll talk about in just a moment. This insurance map from 1915 illustrates, here's just one example of one moment in time of what was operating there. Um, the roundhouse, which is here somewhere, I know it's, it's over here to give you perspective, okay? Remember, we all remember the bridge, right? That used to go over the creek. But you can see, this is um, Matawan Manufacturing Company, and it's gonna tell you this is storage, there's dyeing, there's picking, there's all sorts of different functions that are needed in all those buildings that you saw. But uh, one really interesting thing that every Beaconite should be really proud of is that this building, what we know today as the Roundhouse, was at one time the machine shop of a man named Horatio, and Swift. Let's say it together. Horatio and Swift. You are really paying attention. And why is that important? Because in the roundhouse, he built our nation's first mechanized lawnmower. It opened there in 1830. Um, later, that building, they're going to manufacture weapons even during the Civil War. Uh, later, Horatio Swift moves his operations across the street but an employee is going to buy him out. They need more space, and unfortunately, they expand over to Newburgh in about 1870. You'll see a lot of that. Businesses are, are moving from one side of the river quite frequently. Ultimately, this swift lawnmower, the first lawnmower ever made in the United States, made right here, is acquired by Toro. Still making lawnmowers, but the first ones were made here in Mattywan. So next time you drive by or perhaps you have a cocktail at the Roundhouse, think about the fact that you're in this historic structure. Right. Across the street at 1 East Main, where that original factory started in 1814, there were also multiple uses through time. These factories were changing owners constantly. Over the years, it was called Carroll's. Anybody remember this Carroll's hat shop? No? Uh, Eli Berman, Bobrick. Um, it was home to manufacturers of, among other things, were made here straw hats, furniture, baby carriages, and electric blankets. And not so long ago, um, I came here in the very early 80s, 82 or 83, and if you look up where this original stone is here, you can still see the original part of the old factory. Does anybody remember being able to see that? Yes. Uh, and it was very jagged because it was hit by a? A train. A train. Okay, you are all, you're my kind of audience. This is great. <laughs> this is great. Now I've lost my, t yes, Denny. Uh, some of the stones in that old factory? Yes. Oh, okay, how interesting. So to give you an idea of how much things would change here, Flux, different employers, in the span of five years from 1935 to about 1940, the factory at 1 East Main Street changed names and product lines from the Eli Berman Company to the Headstrom Union Company to the Bulberg Corporation, respectively makers of bowling alleys, baby carriages, and electric blankets. Bulberg made electrically heated flying suits here during World War II. And for the next two decades, decades, they specialized in making electric blankets. Even during the Great Depression, Beacon was still working, which is pretty remarkable for economy. So um, Amory is very shy and quiet, but I'm going to ask her to stand up and read. This, is, um, this gives you an overview of 1935. So really, you know, the Depression is 29 at the crash, right? So go ahead. Give it your best teacher voice. The year was 1933, and it had been tagged 35. During that year, the city's economic outlook went from bleak to bright as five new firms occupied three once island factory buildings along the Michigan Creek and hired 500 new workers. At the Groveville Mills factory complex, three of the newly opened firms were the Groveville Furniture Company, Lewis, Beacon Cease and Die Company, and the Beacon Crayon, Beacon Lewis Company. At one East Main, the old Carroll's hat shop then there became the Headstrom Union Company, which manufactured baby carriages. And at 10 East Main Street, the old Mace hat shop was sold in July of 1935 to Oscar Bramley from Fourth One, New Jersey, who was prominent in the textile industry there. All right, let's have Joanne read the last paragraph. Your new counterpart crime. <laughs> By November of 1935, Bramley Styler's Steve was in operation with 35 workers employed. Elsewhere, 
1935, with 683 workers employed, a record high number for the Depression in that industry. Think about that. How our economy, I'm not going to say was thriving, but it was sustaining itself during the Great Depression. So few northeastern cities could make that claim. And hats, of course, are so important to the Beacon story. Here's, yeah, that was um, uh, uh, used as a promotional um, hat that they would make, and they would place that in a store to get you to stop and buy their hats. Here's a look at those nearly 700 hat workers. Duchess Hat Works, 175. Panama Hat Company, which I'll talk about in a minute, 150. BB, 115. Beacon Ladies Hat Company, 103. Confederate Hat Fell hat 80 and cardiganers 60 different workers so a huge industry having a um, ripple effect on the economy here when all these jobs were employing people imagine what it meant for local families here the hat industry truly kept us alive during the Great Depression and coincidentally the hats especially for men peaked in the 1920s you know what was the the ruin of hats um, automobiles that were open and went so fast they couldn't keep them on their heads and that was one of the factors that that kind of changed and impacted Beacon. Now if we followed the creek south we would come to the Tyronda Hat Works built in 1879 by Lewis Tompkins. He's credited with the man who really put Beacon on the map as the hat capital of New York State. Now six years earlier he had set up his hat shop, his first one, Right here on Lower Main, where we are, uh, back in 1873, that Tyronda Hat Shop on South Avenue. Oh, did I change that? No. Uh, that's the original one on the creek. Was sold to Merrimack Hat Corporation. In 1939, Merrimack had 200 workers running two shifts, producing 1,200 ladies' and men's hats a day. Compute that out, just work days, 3.8 million hats being made in this complex here. Now this is the former Cardiganer hat shop, and this was Tompkins' first factory, and this literally sat where we are today. Later years, the Skyline Clothing Corporation, for those of you who might recognize that, on 16 Main, where the corner of Bank Street is. This was the site of the original Duchess Hat Works. It was Fishkill Landing, you know, our predecessor, Beacon's biggest hat concern, started by Lewis Tompkins Hose in 1874. Even in the 1890s, he was turning out about 450 dozen or 5,400 hats every single day. Cardiganer later purchased the old Duchess Hat Factory in 37 and manufactured hats here for another 20 years. In a 1950 Beacon News feature, Cardiganer's was the lone really large important hat firm remaining in Beacon, a city once known as the hat capital of New York. And in 1950, Cardiganer's still employed 320 workers, making 120,000 dozen hats in 300 different styles. Think about that. 120,000 dozen hats in 300 different styles were coming out of Beacon. We were second only to Danbury, Connecticut. Who knows the last hat factory to shut its doors? Sure. Excellent! John Hopper in the Hopped Up on History program. A plus. <laughs> you said if you sat up here, did you have to talk? I didn't think you would have to, but we even had a Panama hat shop. In the 1920s, again, according to the Beacon Journal, straw hat making was the city's leading industry. You think of straw hats, you think of down south, right? Six separate hat making firms were producing straw hats here in Beacon. In May of 26, Beacon's newest straw hat manufacturer, the Genuine Panama Hat Works, opened its factory on Jones Street, now Burplank Avenue, and quickly began producing straw hats for a very short season, which only ran for four months. You didn't wear it a day before, and you didn't wear it a day after it started on May the 15th. Anybody know where this building was? Yes! Oh my God! I'm going to buy you a beer afterward. Well done. Well done. So you know, if you're looking at my roast, which is today now in the tap house, and you're going up the hill, uh, there's an empty lot there. That's essentially where it was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I thought if I could find it, is that right? <laughs> right? We don't need any comments in the peanut gallery. Just answers to the question. <laughs> All right, I want you to know that hat making was in no small measure an easy industry. Like most industrial concerns of the day, you work 16 hours a day and you work for very poor pay. We know that child labor was employed here in Beacon in our factories and there were dangerous working conditions. The hat work process itself um, required chemicals. There was no modern ventilation. Um, notice here, 
that it is so hot that they are really essentially working in their underclothes. You can see that. Imagine on this heat that we've had experienced some days this summer, working in these terrible conditions, no ventilation, all chemicals. Here, these workers, actually, if you look at their legs, appear to be wearing long johns to protect themselves from the heat. Hat making, of course, is notorious for exposing its workers to mercury. In the 19th century, fur treated with mercury was used to make felt hats. Hatters were confined in these small spaces and they breathed in these toxic mercury fumes and it resulted in what was considered mad behavior. So we get a character like the mad hatter, okay? Uh, prolonged exposure to mercury caused employees to actually develop a variety of physical and mental ailments including tremors, speech problems, emotional instability, even hallucinations. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Danbury, Connecticut was the only other place making more hats than we did, but there is actually something called the Danbury Tremors, or excuse me, the Danbury Shakes, and it was the tremors that were experienced by hatters. The use of mercury in the production of felt wasn't banned until the 1940s. So, so far tonight we've covered our earliest and our largest manufacturers uh, by discussing the Manamon manufacturing complex there, right, and our hatting industry. So I do want to move on to lots of other products that were built here. And I'm talking now about this building here. John Rothery was a man who emigrated here to our villages in 1835, and he began making handmade industrial files. This is the first of its kind in the United States. He brought his sons into the business, John Jr. and William. They carried the business well into the 1890s, making the only hand-cut files with no machinery used in the process at all. An England newspaper in Sheffield called the company's file one, if not the best, produced in the United States. Rothery file workers are here with their boss, John Rothery, on the far right. Do you see him kind of leaning up against the tree in the dark suit? This is about 1870. The front row of the photograph reveals very young boys who are on the job here. Rothery made all of his young apprentices sign an indenture and an oath of good behavior. His contract required the young men not to play dice, cards, or any other unlawful game. And quote, the children, quote, should not haunt alehouses, taverns, or dance houses. <laughs> so I guess they wouldn't be here tonight. And, and in exchange for agreeing to those conditions, they received two hours in wages for six days of work per week. This handsome brick building that you see here was right on the Fishkill Creek, yeah. and it caught fire on October the 27th, 1886, under very mysterious circumstances. Um, it burned completely to the ground, but what's so significant about that fire is the fact that all of the newspaper accounts from the entire area of the Hudson Valley talked about there is no fire department in the village of Matiwan. So the devastating loss of that factory very likely was the impetus for the men of Matiwan to organize Beacon Engine soon after the fire. Yes. What do you mean by industrial files? Like, like think about big metal files that are have edges on them that other industries would use when they're making machinery and and, and okay. sanding down. Is, is there anybody mechanical is a better explanation than that? But um, so for nearly 60 years in Matiwan, the Rothery file after 60 years of operation, it was actually sold to the First National Bank of Matiwan when it went into foreclosure in 1897. The Rothery's house, by the way, anybody know where it was? We talked about it in our greatest states. The Elks Club, he's three for three in the front row. <laughs> it got built into the Elks Club. So think where their house is, the Elks Club, right? It originally faced the mountain, and it also faced where their factory was here on the creek. Now, you all drive this all the time, Groveville, right? Well, legend has it that a man named A.T. Stewart, who was a millionaire merchant in New York City, built these mills because he was snubbed by a business rival. The story goes that in 1875, when a rival entrepreneur refused to sell him some high-end carpets for his stores in New York City, he decided he would build his own, and so he did in Groveville. He opened, uh, he opened up the competition by building the Glenham Carpet Mill at Groveville at a cost, and this is um, in 1875, of $1.5 million, or about $43 million today. He also built the approximately 30 workers' houses uh, there in 1876, and we all know what those are, right? Yeah. So this was all built because of a snub. Somebody wouldn't sell him the carpets, and so he said, well, I got you, I'll, I'll, I'll make my own. Unfortunately, these operations moved out in 1892, and this mill became a silk and embroidery mill. In the Great Depression, Lewitties and Sons of New York City furniture manufacturers purchased Groville Mills. 
Groveville had been vacant for so long at that point that it still had World War I propaganda posters hanging in it, and that's, um, you know, in 1834. Soon the Witties had the Groveville Furniture Company, the Beacon Rayon Fabrics Corporation, the Beacon Peace Dyeing and Finishing Company, and the Ridgewood Silk Company all in operation in this complex. Then it became Beacon Looms, which some of you may remember that name. These photos are from an undated article in the Curtain and Drapery Department magazine put out by Beacon Looms from its headquarters at 261 Fifth Avenue in New York City. Uh, Beacon Looms was a well-established local factory. It operated from 1935 up until the 1980s. It was bought by another firm. And if you go out and search on the internet, you can still find products that are called Beacon Looms. I just bought a set of curtains that are called Beacon Looms. Interestingly enough, also in this complex, during World War II for the War Department, Max Danoff, who's the, the gentleman that you see here from this magazine spread, had a contract with the War Department to build camouflage nets for servicemen. He was the son of the company's founder, later its president, and he is credited with more than 100 patterns relating to the design and manufacture, in particular, of knitted curtains. These photographs, by the way, from this magazine spread were given to us by Gary Barrick because his father worked there at Beacon Looms. Anybody remember Beacon Looms? Okay. Now, switching kind of eras, and let's head, we hop around and hopped on history. Beacon had three carriage manufacturer, or wagon, or sleigh manufacturers on Main Street, Sewell's, Petty's, and William H. Jackson. That's what we see here. This is by far the longest lasting, most productive of the big three. Anybody recognize that building? Yes. You can't answer. <laughs> We're squashing him for a turn. Anybody else? Is that from Yankee Clipper, right? Okay. Okay. Um, it was said that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's grandfather bought the first carriage and his mother bought the last carriage that was made here from the Jackson family. This was the Sewell's work, uh, which was down on the other end of Main Street. Three-story building, as you can see from the caption above. Um, it's across from M&T Bank. Is it M&T anymore? Probably not. Uh, it had a blacksmith shop, a woodworking shop, a showroom on the ground floor, trimming room, paint shop on the second, tenements for the workers on the third floor. This arched area that you see here is still here. This is on West Main Street. Everybody recognize this building? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So imagine the carriages that were going out of there. Wouldn't we love to have one of those um, in our collection? And there was that third manufacturer, Petty's, that burned, it's, it was no longer standing. We don't have any images of it at all. Okay, let's talk about the Fishkill Landing Machine Company. It is gonna grow out of, think of it as a little cottage industry, out of that early Matawan Manufacturing Company up by the creek, right? Uh, it's gonna build a brick two-story 40 by 120 foot building in 1853, and it's gonna locate down here to the village of Fishkill Landing and be um, on the waterfront. By the late 1870s, the Fishkill Landing Machine Company had patents on all the components of the mill steam traction engine. In addition to threshers and locomotive steam traction engines, it manufactured a farm engine, a self-moving locomotive engine. So locomotive engines are being manufactured on our waterfront here. A self-contained engine that was used in a stationary position. Um, in an 1879 advertisement that you see here, um, at least one of these tractors survives today, and it is located, as you see on the right, in the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Now, if you look over to the right of the screen, you'll see something that I just purchased. It's an ad for um, the fish kill landing machine, or the, excuse me, it's the Matiwan, that earlier Matiwan manufacturing um, company, which I'll talk more about, I think, in just a minute. But these were huge firms that were selling their products and these machinery and sending them all over the world. Back to here, to the Fishkill Landing Machine Shop. During the Civil War, this was one of the most important munition plants in the entire North. It was making all the ammunition and shot for the cannons that were made at the West Point Foundry down in Cold Spring. It later became famous as Corliss in Engines. Um, still known locally, though, as the Fishkill Landing Machine Shop, they would just have the rights to produce what were called Corliss Engines. And in the Vienna World Fair, which was held in the 1870s, our Fishkill Landing Machine Company sent a cordless engine there that won the first prize and received the highest praise. An estimated 700 cordless steam engines were made there and sold throughout the world. Massive engines, folks. The cordless Fishkill Landing Machine Shop was located on the riverfront. Um, this is a grainy photo from the Beacon News. In April 1909, what strikes? Fire. 
The building was completely destroyed, including a building that had about $100,000 worth of its patents on hand. Um, the incident left the company in a shambles, and in April 1913, its production machinery, engine parts, and other equipment were sold at an auction. Its property was subsequently purchased by the New York Central Railroad, which wanted to, uh, the factory lid so it could expand to four tracks here in this area. Now this is Henry Skank's machine cop, and this is what I wanted to tell you about that the advertisement is for framed <coughs> over on the table. Um, Henry Skank and his two older brothers, Samuel and John, were manufacturing their patented industrial sized wood, industrial sized wood planing and wood molding machines here. They manufactured them. They were sold all over the eastern seaboard. Uh, they had been in business for about 20 years in Massachusetts, and then they came here uh, to Beacon. Now, if you look over on the right, you're going to see a more modern photograph of a gentleman who's using one of these Woodworth planers, and I'll tell you the story of it. Charles Wardwell of Sackett's Harbor, New York, wrote to us in 2012 with photographs of his old skink wood planing machine. It had been made right here in Madiwan. He wrote, quote, as you can see, the patented 1869 skink planer is still very much in use. On occasion, I've run it in blizzards as well as freezing rain. It's a so-called three-sided planer. It dresses the top of the board plus both edges. You can dress the edges straight or make it shiplap. You can also make tongue and groove. It is a 24-inch wide machine, and it runs quietly and uses very little power. I run it with a PTO shaft and a 38-horsepower tractor. This turns the cutter head at 1,900 RPM, which is about half of a modern speed, but just right for a skank machine. Imagine, still operating, right? A satisfied customer 125 years later. <laughs> now, where he made these machines is a building that's still standing, and I know you're all going to recognize it. 578 Main Street, right? So these famous planers that are still in operation around the world were made in this machine. 578 uh, Main, between Ackerman and Herbert, has had nine lives, or at least nine owners, that we know of since it was built in the 1880s. That makes it one of the most swapped over adaptive factories in our history. And yes, even hats were made here. The list of owners and their products starts with that Samuel Skank machine shop, which had made woodworking planers here. Next, the foundry in back of the building was the enticement for a company called Green Fuel Economizer to be here in the 1890s until they would move across the street to what was known as the Blossom Estate, and I'll talk about them at the end. By 1902, a check of the society's directories now finds the Corrington Air Freight Company here. Corrington made brakes for railroad cars. The company was doing so well for a few years until another competitor named Westinghouse entered the brake market and suddenly 578 was available again. But imagine locomotive brakes are being made here in Beacon, and again, shipped around the world. After 1914, the names in consecutive order of these new manufacturers were the Litauer Silk Mill, the Werber Leather Coat Company, and the BB Corporation. Weber was one of the oldest makers of leather coats in the country. It took possession in 1928, and it promised then to employ 100 men and women. By the late 1930s, coats were out, BB's hats were in. The coming years brought more makeovers for our building. In 1952, the Cold Spring Dyeing and Finishing Company was there. By 1962, the Ultra Peace Dye Works was there. And believe it or not, it's released again. And I have no doubt that someone will, um, someone will take it. This is a picture of what's advertised on the, the, the online site for the realtor. And the space is described as inspiring and raw. <laughs> so it should be described as historic, right? All right? Here's one you probably don't know too much about. Unless you're a Beacon Historic Society newsletter member, news, Historic Society member with the newsletter. And that is the Beacon Boot and Shoe Company. It was shown here about 1887 on Main Street between South Elm and South Walnut. So it sent you down by the DMV, right? The Nash brothers, William and Fred, came to Fishkill Landing again from Massachusetts in 1886 with this grandiose plan to open a shoe and boot factory in what was then, brace yourself folks, this building was here, it was a roller skating rink. Oh, wow. They raised, again this is 1886, they raised $21,500 in stock certificates for $50 a share to the local public. So maybe some of your grandparents bought in to the great boot and shoe company, right? It employed about 70 workers. They specialized in footwear called Milwaukee oil grain, glove grain, and buff, and they made women's, children's, and youth's shoes that were, quote, both machine sewed and standard screw. But the seemingly successful concern suddenly closed the next year, 1888. The Nashes left town, abandoned their wives, and the boot and shoe factory. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So in a, in a lifespan of about 40 years, this building went from that roller rink to the shoe factory to become an opera house, P PD's Academy of Music, and finally to a movie theater, the State Theater, where the first movies in Deacon were shown. But the building was destroyed by fire in 1926. Okay, let's move on to New York Rubber. Established here in 1857 on Tyronda Avenue, right along the creek. Uh, it left its mark on Beacon over the course of a very successful 100-year history, manufacturing a variety of rubber products from toys and dolls, one of the first businesses to make rubber toys and dolls in the United States, to industrial belting. On the same site in 1845, Charles Walcott and Robert Rankin, and his wife was a Rankin, so there's a relation, I don't know if it was a brother or her father, built what was that first called the Wikipedia Cotton Mill. It was an early manufacturer of cotton jeans. So they're making jeans in this factory. Charles Wolcott sells the mill to New York Rubber Company in 1857, but he also becomes the largest stockholder. So it's kind of a transaction within his own portfolio. New York Rubber Company was one of the first factories authorized to use Charles Goodyear's patented vulcanizing process. Henry Wolcott, the son of Charles, is credited with inventing a machine that revolutionized the production of children's hollow toy balls and rubber dolls. So you can see on the far right a rubber doll that we were fortunate enough to add to our collection made at the New York Rubber Company. Rubber balls, toys, and dolls were made at the Beacon plant until 1923, but then after that, the company specialized in rubber hoses, belts, and wraps. Little trivia for you, the first rubber tennis ball in the United States was made in this factory. The company's most noted achievement, however, came in October the 18th, 1943, right in the middle of what? Thank you. I know you're all awake and paying attention. When, when our native son, Under Secretary of the Navy, a Beacon native, James Forrestal, comes here to present the Army Navy E Award for Excellence in Wartime Production to the factory workers here. These rubber shop employees had earned this prestigious national award for their efforts in making rubber rafts and May West life jackets for the Army and Navy as well. They also made an inflatable pontoon bridge for the Army's Engineering Corps during World War II. And just kind of a funny aside, some of you may remember Bob Cahill, right? Uh, he was um, shot down over the water, and he, as he was floating down in his parachute, he told me that, and he kept thinking about the fact that all of his friends were back home in Alps Sweet Shop because it was a Sunday morning, and he knew that's where he was supposed to be. And he landed in the, in the ocean. There was a rubber life raft there that he was able to get into. And we got into it. It was made at New York Rubber Company Beacon. Oh. So was that a sign or what? He was taken as a prisoner of war. Yeah. At its high point, 1944, New York Rubber employed about 600 workers. Unskilled women at the time, 1944, were making 55 cents an hour. Unskilled men, 62 cents an hour. Uh, but after a strike by the workers, New York Rubber closed for good, May of 1960. Technical Tape Company bought the factory. Uh, we know it as Tuck Tape, right? They sold it to Beacon Mills Partnership in August of 93. After a fire in the southern half of the building, was factory was raised in October of 2005. Now it's being developed for housing. housing. Okay. How many of these stories all end the same? Now, let's talk about another man named Morgan Potter. He literally put the brakes on carriages and wagons in the United States. His 1880s pension called the famous Potter Spring Break Block, made stopping a carriage or any other kind of a heavy wagon a safe and so much easier than any other wagon uh, brake that, that existed at the time. Simply put, he covered 12 inches of the wheel under all loads. That was a vast improvement over what was available others. They might have to skid for feet before they could stop, and he got that down to a foot. Morgan began his career as a builder of high-grade carriages and coaches. We talked about Beacon's carriage manufacturers. He moved to Fishkill Landing about 1887, worked for a blacksmith near the water, um, waterfront. The financial success of his patents allowed him to start his own manufacturing plant at 17 North Avenue. The building in the 1960s was the home of Crescent Lingerie. Oh, Later, yes. the, at the theater supply. I remember going down there for costumes and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, then it was Hudson Valley Pack and Paddle, and I've lost track of what it what else has been. But that building also, he expanded into an auto machine shop and garage, and he may have even built his very own car in that garage. In 1981, our society received an inquiry from an automobile encyclopedia publisher asking about a car called The Beacon manufactured in 1917 at the Morgan Potter Motor Company of Beacon. 
Neither then nor now could we answer any questions about it. He may have only manufactured one or two of these vehicles, the Beacon. So we can't talk about things made in Beacon without discussing at least a high level our brick production, the Hudson's extensive clay deposits, and our proximity to the metropolitan area in New York um, really made it a natural industry that thrived here. You know their names, Timoney, Aldridge, Budd, and many others, but the Dennings Point Brickworks is probably the most notably remember, remembered, and so many of their bricks ended up in New York City. This was hard and demanding work. You look on the lower right hand, um, you'll see, and this actually was a photograph that we were able to receive from Central Hudson. Um, this was when an electric clay shovel was introduced to the build business in 1922, revolutionizing the way that they were able to um, scoop up the clay and turn it into brick production. Um, now with that electric narrow gauge railway running along a clay bank, um, it took all kind of the, the human intervention out of it. Uh, which made it much safer. The problem with the clay banks where the Dennings Point, we all know where Dennings Point is, right? The problem with the clay banks there is that they begin to encroach upon the clay from the bank of the village, right? And so places like on South Avenue, their foundations are now starting to um, have issues. If you know the Christie House, for example, it was across the street. In the 1920s, they picked it up and moved it across the street to the place you know now because the clay bank behind it was being undermined by all of this. And so we know now that the, uh, although many of the houses in Burnsville, if you know the neighborhood where the brick workers lived, um, even, even there they were experiencing all these problems. So several of them had to be moved away. And by 1926, um, they're looking at where they're going to move. But at the same time, they're facing incredible demand for their product. 1926. 26, they had a record production of 60 million bricks there out of those clay banks. But New York City is growing at all kind of fast rates of speed. So by May of 27, they're estimating they're going to make 100 million bricks at Jennings Point. At that time, they, that required them to operate both day and night to meet the production quotas. In the 20s, this was the high point of the dead and uh, brickyards with its yearly production surpassing um, all of the great Haverstraw brickyards downriver combined. Within a decade or so, these clay banks were all used up, and the Dennings Point brickworks, which had been located literally on Dennings Point for about 50 years, closed down and moved about two miles north to... Rock, rock, you can rock, say rock, it. Rock, 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 <laughs> Everybody have a Dennings Point brick or two in their yard? Oh, and their yes. Okay, okay <laughs> all right. <laughs> While bricks are well known, some items are less so. Here's an example from the 18... Hundreds, the late 1800s, local druggists frequently made their own bottles and made up prescriptions. Some of, the, uh, some of the more enterprising, like Henry Bevier of Matawan, even concocted secret remedies. This was his expectorant, and it is said to have sold well all over the East Coast. Most of these cure-alls contain large doses of alcohol, opium, or laxatives. Uh, these bottles still frequently turn up on, on eBay all the time or sometimes in backyard gardens if you're digging. So um, the expectorant was made right here. And so we should be proud, proud of that. Another claim um, related, claim to fame that was a magical con concoction was Ben Hammond's insecticide factory, which dates back to the 1880s, then located on what was known as Long Wharf. Um, today, Scenic Hudson owns essentially where it is. Anybody remember? They have a red structure there. But it is based as a replica of the original red, original Hammond building. It's not that, that same building, but they did a good job of trying to replicate the building. Um, he made Hammond's slug shot and paint works. He had it painted all over the side so that, that all important bridge traffic, right? Because all these manufacturers, all these boaters are going up and down the Hudson River, are going to be able to see his building. And he's going to make sure it's very flamboyant. Um, he manufactured a variety of insecticides for home gardeners and even for commercial farmers. Ben Hammond also made on this site house paints, including one color called Mount Beacon Green. Um, here's one you may not know too much about. We made tires in Beacon. The, the Beacon tire had a relatively brief lifespan from about 1917 to 1923, so only about five years. But the company had an undeniable impact by spreading our name nationwide because Beacon, if you can see it here, appeared on every one of their tires and also in every one of their newspaper ads that they ran all the way from Pennsylvania to Florida throughout the 1920s. We believe this is the very first time, this use of Beacon, that you're ever going to see on a local product because our city had only been founded in 1913. 
Okay, so this is 1917, they start operation at the Beacon Tire Company. Uh, they were located on River Street near the foot of Lower Main Street in a building that was right near Tompkins Hat Straw Works that he had here, separate from this building that was here. Things did get off to a rocky start in 1917 with the start of World War I. The government cut back on rubber production by two-thirds. But by 1922, when automobile production was spiking in America again, all those cars that are now on the road, the factory was producing about 500 tires a day. So we do have one of these in our collection. Uh, the Society's Beacon Cords tire was 32 by 3 and a half inches, and it sold for $18.40 back in 1923. That was not an insignificant sum of money. We talked earlier, we had our, our contestants, our participants, read to us a little bit about things that were happening in the 1920s. Um, when the Great Depression hit, Beacon, as I said before, was able to stay alive. It kept its head above water. Uh, there was, in fact, some optimism. The Beacon News of July 1929 is showing that the Nabisco carton plant is well <coughs> under construction by a Buffalo firm. <coughs> by Christmas of that year, the factory was complete and net near ready for production. The first press run is going to come in January, and by February, the biscuit was making regular shipments and even had a night shift soon after. It would go on to produce million of car millions of cardboard boxes. In 1953, the factory employed, this amazes me, 600 men and women. Imagine 600 workers here. And again, that economic spin-off effect of having 600 good paying manufacturing jobs here in our community. And we all know what they were primarily making was that animal cracker box. In 1985, Federal Paper Board Company bought the building and continued printing operations until about 1990. And, and we all know Dia Beacon um, opened its doors in May of 2003. And I didn't just want to tell you, if you don't know the story of it, um, whether it was the president or the chairman of the board of the Dia Art Gallery in Chelsea at the time, was flying a uh, personal plane, I guess he was like an amateur pilot, down the Hudson River. And as he came over this building, which he did not know was empty and for sale at the time, he saw the open skylight, jagged industrial style roof, which allowed all this natural light into the building. And he said that would be perfect for a new art gallery because it has all that natural light. Well, why was it built with all that natural light? Because they wanted to make sure that the employees matched correctly the dye lots for all those packaging that making so that your box of animal crackers looked exactly like this box that arrived a month earlier in terms of its coloring. So that was really the enticement for Dia to come here. I want to talk a little bit about a company called Duchess Tool. Um, take you back to the 1880s. Um, it's hard to overexpress what Beacon um, Duchess Tool meant to this community. Um, it was first based upon the invention of an oven lamp for bakery equipment. The inventor was a man named Frank Van Houten, who with his brother founded Duchess Tool Works in 1886. And for those of you that came to the Great Estates show, I showed you this was the great house that was where the Colonial Springs condominiums are now. The Van Houtens ran the company, which made an assortment of bakery equipment in the South Avenue factory until 1941, when Frank sold the company to Lidgerfield Manufacturing of New Jersey. Still carrying the Duchess Tool name, the new owners soon retooled their machinery to meet demands of what? Vital defense production work in the 1940s, like other companies that I talked about here. The company still made bakery equipment, but then now they were making, for Liberty and Victory cargo ships, sailing in war zones, this telemeter is, I think, the correct telemotor? I don't know if it's telemotor or not, but they also made windlasses, winches, and steering stands and other maritime equipment. Before the war, the company employed about 55 men. 1943, at peak production, they had about 500 employees. So you see here, working three shifts, seven days a week, to make all of this. And I will just leap out here to say, believe it or not, my former father-in-law, who's now deceased, is this young lad here. So he was born in 1919. I assume this is a picture after the war. He surely after that went up and worked in Mattywan up on the hill. Uh, 1959, however, all the equipment of Dutchess Baker's machinery was loaded onto trucks during the week of April 15th, and it was hauled off to Superior, Wisconsin. It is still operating there under the same name. It's still called Dutchess Tool, but it's out in Superior, Wisconsin. And guess what? Some of the machinery in high end Industrial kitchens still operating. You can buy this on face on eBay. <laughs> Duchess dough divider, 20-piece dinner roll machine. That's the same product advertised in the ad down on the right. 
If we could afford it, we'd buy it and have it shipped from Texas. But um, still in use, still in operation. Pretty amazing. And um, I have been told by other people that Duchess, uh, particularly their bakery equipment, is still in use. Beacon's factory supported another really important World War II industry, insulated clothing. It was a necessity for our bomber crews that had to fly in sub-zero temperatures during World War II. Aero Leather had two factories operating here in Beacon making leather jackets and flying suits for our airmen. One plant was on Ferry Street, the other was near Main and Cross Streets, and I think that is where that vacant building is essentially on Main and Cross Street. I think that's where it was located. They both employed hundreds of workers throughout the war effort making these, uh, these leather goods. Um, it was founded in 1937 to make leather coats, but it pivoted to this important war work. And um, who shall I put to work? Maxine. Nice loud voice now. Read what, what this is. This is an internal um, Aero Company newsletter talking to their employees about how important their war work is. Go ahead, Maxine. Please. Let somebody else. All right, Fred, come on. Much is expected these days of workers from Aero Leather by the United States Army Air Forces. We shall need more than 100,000 bombers and fighter planes to clear the path for the American boys to be sent across the English Channel to France. To man these planes, flyers of the armed forces must be clothed. Clothing them is the most vital necessity of the day. That is our job, clothing them. We dare not fail. Mm -hmm. So imagine these products. Um, you know, I mentioned so ever so briefly James Forrest still coming here to give the rubber company its E for Excellence Award, but he is largely credited with turning the U.S. economy from manufacturing all sorts of things into a wartime economy that made all the things that our crews needed in all branches of the, the military. Uh, taking, for example, a, a factory that might make musical instruments, uh, tubas or something, and turning them into making the valving needed for our ships. He is largely credited with turning our economy around. You can see that his hometown really responded and had an enormous impact on the war. It is important to note that after Pearl Harbor, a woman's place was what? No longer in the home, was it? It was also in the workplace. The war effort required more workers. Millions of women answered the call, including our own Beacon residents. On the local scene in particular, hundreds of women took jobs at Aero Leather to make those leather jackets and flying suits. Among those who answered the ad in 1942 for a machine operator era was Wanda Petrowski Shramick. Anybody know her, Wanda? Yes, so shy. Hard to remember. She was so outgoing and so fun. So she told us at the time what it was like to work here in the middle of this war effort. So this is a quote from Wanda. We knew how to sew on home machines, but learning to operate a high-speed machine was a real challenge. But with practice and knowledge that they were doing their part to win the war, Wanda and her co-workers assembled thousands of jackets and aviator suits that were to be worn by our boys serving around the world. Before she passed away in 1915, she reminisced about working there, quote, we put in many long overtime hours to meet deadlines and jackets and flying suits and lots of Saturdays too. And even today when former Aero people meet and reminisce, we think of those days of helping in the war effort as the best of times. So they were part of something bigger than themselves, right? I just find that so amazing and yet everybody thinks we're just a tourist destination, right? We were so much more people and I hope you appreciate that now. Post-war products that were made here in local factories included this interesting example, a quiver and arrows made by Sportsman's Accessories, Inc. in about 1955. It was located down here, One River Street, had between 35 and 60 employees throughout the 1950s. It specialized in hexagon fiberglass fishing poles under the trade name Plyfex, producing, I think it's Flex, excuse me, I knew that's a typo on my script, sorry, Plyflex, producing about 200,000 of these rods every year. We'd love to have one of those in our collection. In this 1952 photograph, so again, post-war we're talking now, parts of the industrial fan are being loaded on a railroad car, car to be shipped to, can you read it there? Australia. Many of you will recognize this as green fuel economizer, green fan, the fan, the economizer. They ship products all around the globe. Um, it was begun here in 1896. The sole American firm in the United States authorized to use the economizer technology that had been invented by a man named Edward Green, that's why it's called Green, back in England in 1845. Green Fuel bought the Blossom property, what we know today is, uh, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, the, the Talix property, right, off of Fishkill Avenue in Maine. You know, Main Street used to cut right through there, and when their production had really ramped up, they went to the city 
We want you to cut it over and go through Blackburn the way it does. The factory manager's name was Blackburn at the time. So Main Street got truncated on that end, and then truncated on this end by urban renewal, kind of cut off on both ends. But that green fuel economizer plant had been the Blossom uh, factory. Here they're going to make mechanical draft fans, radio flow fans, furnace fuel economizers, extended service economizers, cinder traps, dust traps, air preheaters, forced and induced draft fans, blowers and exhausters, steam heating coils, and other industrial equipment used in factories and other power plants. Imagine sending them all over the world, these, these different components of factories. The images at the right hand side of the screen are from a 110 page 1904, 1904 company catalog and I will come over and I will read that what it says here. So they're sending this to their customers. Green's improved patent fuel economizer for steam boilers. Sole makers in the United States, the Green Fuel Economizer Company of Matiwan. Their offices were in all very similar in size and importance. Matiwan, New York, Boston, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. But they also had operations in Manchester, and I'm too close to it now, but Glasgow, Birmingham, can't even read that because I'm too close, and Johannesburg, South Africa. But where were they all made? Here, okay? Imagine, they had their other offices in places like San Francisco and New York and Boston, but everything was being made here in Beacon. And I think that's pretty, pretty remarkable. And then the fuel economizer that you see, economizer came out of the same publication down the right hand side. Can you see the size of the men in comparison to the size of the fuel economizer? So these fuel economizers are going to make your industrial processes more efficient by running through. This is the man, okay? And this is the size of the economizer that he's standing next to. And that particular economizer made here in Beacon um, was shown at a beet factory in Salinas, California. The factory closed in the 1980s after nearly 90 years of operation. You may be more familiar with the factory's uh, use from 1986 until 2006 when it operated as the Talix Art Foundry, which is now over in Rock Tavern, Orange County. I believe that when their pilot, their payment in lieu of taxes agreement ran out with the city beacon, they hightailed it to somebody else that would, that would make them pay taxes. So anyway. Uh, how proud we should be of the things that were created here in those 20 years. Uh, many of you will remember when Il Cavallo, the horse, uh, Da Vinci's horse, is made here, cast here in Beacon, massive. Um, the FDR uh, monument in, in uh, Washington, D.C. On the right, that's the Firefighters Memorial in, in Albany. And then in particular, I wanted to call your attention to the, the Korean Toad. Remember they were outside the building? It was such an eerie sight when you drove by and you saw them. Um, and then here they are actually down in Washington, D.C. But what you may not know is that Beacon had actually a connection to the real life ponchos that were actually used by our soldiers during the Korean War. Um, the factory that made the rain gear was Bulbridge Manufacturing at 1 East Main Street, right back the earliest site of the Madawan Manufacturing Company. Founded in 1943, Bulbridge jump-started right into the war effort by producing electrically heated flying suits for the Army Air Force. By 45, they had 700 workers, mostly women, sewing the clothing or assembling electronic hardware for the suits that kept American bomber crews warm in sub-breezing atmosphere up above. After World War II, when lucrative government contracts became scarce, Bulbridge again relied on innovative thinking and it diversified into making electric <laughs> blankets for the next 15 years. But in 1952, the Korean War comes. It's going to secure another war contract. Again, 1 East Main Street. By July, hundreds of sewing machine operators at Bobrick are busy filling a government order for 410,000 ponchos. See them all wearing it here? The rain gear was made of nylon, uh, had a hood. It was a cut full body that allowed the soldier to carry it, um, his firearm in the inside of the coat to keep it dry and protected. The ponchos were designed for multi-purpose use from being a half sheet in a blanket to a personal shelter. So it's kind of neat that the statues were made here and there were ponchos, which were actually made in Beacon as well. And finally, it's about 8 o'clock, our last product of the night is I think, and I'm hoping someone is going to correct me and I'm wrong, when I say I believe this is our only large scale manufacturer left in Beacon, Kempreen on Fishkill Avenue. The company established itself in the 1950s, focusing on manufacturing military and government rubber-coated fabrics, Kempreen expanded into automotive and specialty applications, such as its lightweight rubber conveyor belting, which is seen here. Um, it has a 225,000 square foot facility. According to its website, it molds custom specialty products used within the automotive, medical, aerospace, 
process control, water and fuel markets, as well as many other industries. So if, next time you see a belt, you know, it may very well have been made here by Kempreen in Beacon. Does anybody know of any other manufacturing firm that's actually making anything in Beacon? Yeah. Yeah. A lighting company, I think? A lighting yeah. company? Yeah. Yeah. There's some, so, oh, all right. So we'll have to look into that, but it, it, based upon this proud tradition of, of manufacturing in Beacon, um, I would like to think that there are others. So. Um, Thank you so much. I know that I didn't cover every single manufacturer. I know that I didn't cover every single product that we had at Beacon, but I did try to share with you some I found to be the most compelling or interesting. So um, before we do a few of our kind of business and commercial things and draw our door prize, does everybody have a door prize ticket, a little pink ticket? All right. My, my assistant, Miles, is going to help me with that in a minute, but let me just do a few commercial messages, if that's all right. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Sorry, you might have said it during the presentation, but why is Groville called Groville? Um, it was a name associated with it because it was a grove of trees. Oh. So. And he called it Groville Blenheim, something or other. How did Blenheim get it? Now? Yeah, I think that there was probably cross ownership of the Glennon plant, which many of you know before was Texaco Research Center. Also had many uses. These factories changed, made um, uh, uh, blue indigo uniforms for the Union Army during the Civil War. So those complexes are going to change hands. And what surprises you when you read about the history of it, oftentimes they're changing hands for like tax reasons. Yeah. Or they're selling it to their brother to get out from underneath taxes. So what's all this new again when it comes to trying to manufacture? Uh, any other questions? Well, Texaco's in Fishkill. <laughs> well, there are beacon people, but I know, but I, when you start, well, when you start doing that, how do you no, stop? Right? When you Texas start going out, you're right, Texaco, uh, 1931 into the 1980s was, was there at the research center, and such a wonderful asset to the Beacon City School District, certainly, but outside the city of Beacon. Yes, Diane? A lot of the products that Denise talked about tonight are on exhibit or in the archives of the Beacon Historical Society, such as the, the tile, the tire, electric blanket, rubber products and the rubber doll, which is adorable, and when you smell it, it smells like rubber. <laughs> so that's, that's all the more reason you need to come up and see. Closing this coming weekend uh, are our two exhibits. One is on Jimmy Lynch, master builder, a man who built many important buildings here in Beacon, but also the great estates of Beacon. That are going to close on the 16th. And then at the end of the month, on September 30th, our new display will go up, and that is going to be about urban renewal. And that's a con uh, collaborative effort with the Helm Public Library, I Am Beacon, and the Highlands Current. Um, these are all the kind of things that we do at the Beacon Historical Society. If you're not yet a member, I have a couple brochures here. It's just $25 a year, and um, you get our fabulous newsletter. Everybody would write, it's fabulous, right? Yes, yes. John Hopper, it's fabulous, right? The newsletter. <laughs> so I have a few copies here to show you. That comes with your membership, as well as our monthly meeting. Our September meeting, now you're getting raw question. Now you're now you're just tiptoeing over the line. Of good uh, our September meeting, September the 26th at the Elks Club, and you are all welcome to attend. We have a representative coming from the New York Bridge Authority and Historic Bridge of the Hudson Valley to talk about the construction of the Newburgh Beacon Bridge in 1963. Uh, many of us took the ferry last month, right when the ferry closed. Uh, the other thing I do want to tell you about is that we have coming up on November the 9th our uh, annual, our seventh annual Beacons of History Award where we recognize an individual, or in this case a couple, um, an organization. You know, I let them talk during the presentation and now they think they can, they can just run rough shot over. Okay, so this year, November 9th, we are honoring Ian and Joanne posthumously um, McDonald, two really great community volunteers. Jo Joanne was, among other things, president of the Tyrone Garden Club. Uh, Ian was the um, president of the board of Howland Library. Uh, but also our Beacon volunteer firefighters with a tradition that lasts over 150 years at a time when our Beacon volunteer firefighters need our support. So I have invitations up here. Please feel free to take one if you'd like to join us. But just like this space, we are selling out like really quickly. We already have about 70 tickets already spoken for, and we only have capacity for about 220. Um, our, our prize tonight, which we're going to get to, Miles, in just a moment, is uh, this fabulous book, um, 38 Years of Bob Murphy's uh, Newsletters. And I do have an extra copy if anybody wants one tonight. I would be more than happy to 
uh, sell it to you. If you have cash, it's $40, or, or if you have a PayPal account. And then finally, I swear this is my last commercial message. Anybody here live or work in a building that is 100 years or older? 100 years or older. Okay. All right, my friend Mel in the back. All right, Denny. Okay, see? Uh, we have a great new program at the Beacon Historical Society. You know, everybody laments the fact that all these new buildings are changing Beacon, right? They're, they're changing our Main Street. Everything is changing so much. We took a look at ourselves and said, well, how can we recognize the people who have cared for and been stewards of these great historic structures, right? People who, who buy an, a structure and maybe give it a whole brand new life. And so uh, we have this new program. They're historic. Uh, property plaques and if you're building and it's in the Beacon City School District is 100 years or older you can purchase one the bronze one is $350 the aluminum is $250 and you uh, it's customized with the date of your structure on it so I'm going to leave this here if anybody wants to take a look at it it's, it's just a way that we are trying to address this issue that everybody's saying oh you're changing Beacon so much well let's give a shout out to the people who are preserving the buildings that make us the community that we are okay uh, I do want to recognize Diane Lapis is our director of special projects, and Barbara is our wonderful secretary. But now, I've had an unbelievable helper here tonight. Miles, come to the front of the room. All right, Miles, who probably has really good eyes and can actually read the number on the, on the, the paint ticket, is going to pull our winner tonight. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to go get the prize, Miles. Okay, pull it out, and then really loud, read out the number on the ticket. Go ahead, Miles, you got it.